<coughs> okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, as Joe said, I'm young. Um, and when I looked at the lineup for this conference, I thought that perhaps my name was there through some sort of admin error. Um, then I realised that Tim and Charlotte don't make errors. Um, so I guess thank you <laughs> for inviting me here. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that I never wanted to be a photographer. Um, my first love was music and in fact still is music. Um, I had a ponytail, I had my lip pierced and I wore clothes that were too small for me. Um, but and I, I went through my A-levels studying music and sound engineering. Um, but then I realised that, you know, I didn't want to do that anymore, kind of right at the end of my A-levels, and found myself kind of scrabbling around, trying to desperately figure out what direction to take next. The only other thing I had was photography. And it's something that had been present in my life for many, many years. Um, I'm sure it's something you can all relate to, in that just through a love of walking and a love of the outdoors, photography kind of came hand in hand with that. I didn't leave the country till I was 18. Every single uh, holiday as a, as a kid was spent just letterboxing and walking on Dartmoor with my family. And as the kind of years went on, I realised that the reason for leaving the house wasn't so much for the walking anymore, it became for the photography. Um, so that was a kind of an indicator that perhaps if music didn't work out, um, maybe I should, you know, direct myself towards that. And so in 2008, I, I signed up to a national diploma course. Um, and at the time, I was only really interested in the single image. I was interested in just making beautiful landscape photographs. That's all I ever wanted to do. And as I progressed on to a degree, they kind of force slash encourage you to think a little bit more about what work you're making, why you're making it, what do you want to talk about with your photography. And it was kind of at that stage where I started thinking more about, less about the single image and more about projects and bodies of work and how I construct narratives and how I can tell stories through a series of images as opposed to trying to communicate everything in one. Um, and so I, I kind of experimented with it when I was at university. Um, but obviously, you know, within the, the kind of constraints of assessment criteria and whatever, I couldn't really realise projects that I really wanted to do. And it was towards the end of my degree that I had this idea of um, Black Dots, which is a project I shot between 2015 and 2018. And I was, I know this is like a cardinal sin, but I'd never been to Scotland and I was a landscape photographer and I'd never been to Scotland. And people talk about it. And so I was researching, just researching like walking holidays and stuff and discovered Bothies online. And I was like, oh my God, what are these? And I started looking into it. And at the time, it was never really a case of, oh, I want to photograph them. It was, oh, these are great. I can stay here and I can just have a really cool experience, you know. But as I was reading more and more about it, I was like, actually, this is a really interesting story. Like, not so much small buildings in big landscapes, but there are a lot of them in, in the project, but more about this community of strangers that they attract. You know, you've got these little... <laughs> They're described as beacons of humanity in these kind of lonely places. And strangers just gather there for a night. And they have this really primitive experience of no phone signal, no internet. You just have fire, food, shelter, warmth, and you share conversation, um, which perhaps is something you don't really do with strangers too often. And then the next day, they'll disappear again. And I was like, well, that would be a really interesting project, just looking at the Bothies, but also looking at the culture <coughs> that surrounds Bothying and and the people that use them. Usually, like, I, um, I give a little explanation of what bothies are, but I'm going to guess most of you probably know. Who's, who's been in a bothy? OK, yeah, so I'll skip that bit. Um, <laughs> so I began planning. And at this time, I I'd kind of I'd graduated. And in order to realise this project, I needed time and money, which never come hand in hand. Um, and someone said to me, oh, there's a, there's a job going down in Cornwall. Um, just a retouching job, cutting out women's clothing on Photoshop from like grey backgrounds to white backgrounds. And I was like, well, that's a, you know, I was pulling points at the time, so that was a step in the right direction. So I spent time basically cutting out women's clothing. That then progressed on to another job, cutting out football boots from grey backgrounds onto white backgrounds. I hate football, and I rarely wear women's clothing. So neither of those things <laughs> were like super relevant to me. But what it did mean is that 
I was moving in the right direction in so much as I was working in the industry that interested me. Um, and so I was working full time doing this and over the time that progressed and I became a sports photographer for about two years a ju in a junior position. Um, but what this gave me then was the money, not necessarily the time, but the money. And so in the evenings I went back and I, I would plan black dots. And obviously living in Devon, I couldn't just pop up to a few bothies every now and then. So what I did is I covered my bedroom wall in my parents' house with maps and put little red stickers on every single bothy um, that were maintained by the Mountain Bothy Association and then planned routes in and routes out, calculated how long it would take me to access um, and also trying to figure out through satellite imagery and the images were already online, the yeah, a kind of a, a good, decent mixture of landscapes and styles of bothies because I didn't want to photograph every single one because that would be, you know, boring. So I wanted to make a good selection that really talked about the wider community. And so in doing this, I was able to plan my trips remotely from home um, and then finally settle on a selection of bothies. Um, <laughs> most of which, obviously, Scotland being the mecca of bothying some in uh, the Lake District in Northern England and a couple in Wales as well. And obviously the problem being working full time and living there. So I was like, all right, so I've, I've figured that out. Uh, this is what I want to shoot. I don't really know how I'm going to realise this. Um, so I realised I had, what, 25 days holiday in a, a working year, but also three days paid sick, <laughs> which rounds it up a little bit. And so, um, and also my old boss is probably watching this live stream today, so I do apologise. Um, he, so yeah, I, I realised that if I planned it around bank holidays and whatever, I could lengthen the amount of time I'd have. So I'd finish my shift and I'd just drive 11 hours to Aviemore or wherever and start shooting. Um, for those that care about such things, as I know there are some, this is what I packed in my bag. Um, I get asked a lot about kit. I'm not a gearhead at all, um, but some people find it interesting. Yes, coal. Um, Bothies, they're basically just empty buildings. So you carry in your own fuel. So, and some of the times I'd stay for the maximum of three nights that you are allowed to stay there. And so I'd carry in my own firewood and coal and everything like that. Um, additionally, I decided to make the, the entire project on large format. It was something I fell in love with at university um, and I could bore you all with technical reasons why I did that, but ultimately, and I think the most important reason, is for me it's the most enjoyable way of making photographs and that's kind of what it's all about. So with that in mind, uh, I'm just going to run you through a series of the photos now uh, from the project. Um, so I'll start with one that's around the corner. Um, this is Warn Scale Head. Uh, photographed at sunrise. Uh, this was actually my first night in a bothy um, and we actually managed to see the northern lights which was I thought we had this really kind of magical experience no one else saw it we got back to the car two days later and it was on BBC News so you know we took all these press images you know ready to send off but um, what something I was doing a lot of during this project uh, I was shooting a lot of behind the scenes work um, and for a handful of days on each shoot, a friend of mine, Andy Ford, <coughs> really, really great photographer in his own right, um, documented me. And I'll talk a little bit about why I did that uh, later on, but you'll see some of his photos coming up in a second. Um, this is one of a really popular bothy, um, Crow and, and the Devil's Point behind it. Um, this was shot in the Cairngorm Mountains in winter. Um, we actually hiked into this before the snow arrived, and we used this amazing app called Windy, which is fairly good at guessing when the snow's gonna come. And we thought, well, if we walk in and snow ourselves in, then we, it'll basically make the approach a lot easier. Um, stayed two nights, and the second morning, this was, you know, the, the snow was right up to the bothy door. Um, and for those that say, you know, you can't shoot large format in horrible weather, this was actually shot in a, in a sort of 60 mile an hour gust that come down the mountain pass. Um, so as it happens, the best composition was behind a conveniently placed boulder. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? Um, but that's me trying to save my camera with a dry bag, which um, doesn't actually work, incidentally. Um, but then, you know, the storm passed, and in between gusts, we, we made that. We made that image. We 
or I decided that I didn't just want to photograph big mountains, because although they're mountain bothies, you can find them on these secluded beaches and on the islands and everything. And I wanted to include that entire cross section of bothying. And so this one here is uh, Peen Minnoch. Um, and we arrived and the, a man called Sandy was already there who'd canoed in, which provided me with this incredible foreground interest that actually made it would be a pretty dull image without that. My friend Andy on, uh, on fire lighting duty as well. There's a couple of behind the scenes from Andy there. Uh, this is um, Cheneval um, and the Great Wilderness or Fishfield Forest behind. Really, really popular bothy with hill walkers and a huge part of this project for me was, was portraits. Um, and there are some portraits in here. Um, so lock the doors because I'm afraid you will see a lot of portraiture. Um, we walked in thinking we're going to get some really interesting portraits here. So we, spent, we factored in two or three days. Um, no one. <laughs> so, and the weather was horrible and we spent the whole time just basically just relaxing in the bothy there. Uh, on the last night, a geography teacher turned up who, if you actually look very closely at the left of the door, despite telling him I'm taking a photo, can you stay inside, he poked his head out and on the bigger prints of it, he's got his huge great grin on his face. Um, but well, the final morning, I was like, look, no one's come that I really want to photograph, so we're going to make a landscape. And so I walked up to this high point above Cheneval and um, the, the, the mist was right up to the lens, couldn't see anything, but as the sun rose, the mist retreated just behind the bothy there, and we, we got that image there. <coughs> um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the walk-in from Dundonnell. And there's a behind the scenes as well there. <coughs> Glenn Cool. Um, I spent a lot of time on my own. <laughs> shooting this, um, this project. So Andy would come up for a few days to do the behind the scenes content and then we'd just leave. And I spent a lot of my time without phone signal, just kind of following the maps and just waiting for the light basically. Um, so I think I spent two to three days just on my own here. Not a lot to do. Um, Paul, you would have had a great time. It's a beautiful beach there for you. Um, but the walk, plastic. no plastic, no plastic. It was, <laughs> um, but the walk-ins, um, it's, you have to come in through across down into the glen in the middle there um, and kind of below uh, I think it's Britain's highest waterfall which as you exit the Bothy you can just see in, in the background there. It's in the top left. So I'd made a load of these landscapes and I spent a lot of time in Bothies and we're starting to become a bit familiar with what to expect um, even down to the smell they all kind of smell the same. Uh, I was, might like, release a scratch and sniff book in the future or something. Um, but I realised that these still lives of little scenes that I found within the Bothies told me a lot about the culture without photographing people. So obviously you can never plan who you're going to find there. You don't know what you're going to find. So every now and then you'd be presented with a scene like this, which is the mantelpiece at Glendu, um, which yeah, I, got, I got a bit of flack from people saying I shouldn't be photographing litter, but you know, they make very convenient... Um, candlestick holders, as you can see, the, uh, the wax dripping down there. But it tells, in my opinion, as a photographer who I've been described as landscape, I've been described as portrait, I've been described as documentary, I don't know what the hell I am. But it, as part of a project, it tells you a lot about the people that have used that place before you and people who might come after. This work also it saw me, for the first time, move into portraiture. I would never ever been interested in photographing people um, all through uni, never did it. Um, and I started this project with no intention of doing it really. Um, but then I realised that I was stupid. And that I'm talking about bothy culture and bothies, which are there for people. Um, and so I said, I'm just going to start making portraits. And so a huge part of this project became the portraiture element. And every single portrait I made, were of total strangers that I met accidentally, um, you know, no pre-planning or anything, and all of them were shot the morning after. So I'd spent the night in the bothy with them, had that bothy experience, and then in the morning would approach them when they're looking their worst, um, which is quite a difficult because you can do the groundwork during the during the night before, and you start dripping it. Oh, I'm doing this project, and you have a little conversation, and sooner or later they become a little bit interested. Um, but actually, the large format camera really helped with that because. They'd never had their photo taken on one of these cameras before. 
So <coughs> you suddenly get that camera out and they come to you. So there are times when I just kind of left it set up, pretending to clean a lens or something. Like that. And they'd come to me and go, oh, what's this? And then that, they're in my world then, they can't get out, and then they have their photo taken. Um, incidentally, as someone who doesn't call himself a portrait photographer, that image, was when the project was released, was the one that magazines led with, and then it won, I believe it was the British Journal of Photography's um, Portrait of Britain Award. So it went on bus stops all over the UK for a month. Um, and I'm a landscape photographer, apparently, so. Uh, this is Adam, also called Jesus by a few people. Um, Jesus stays at Camasunnery Bothy on the Isle of Skye. Not every person I met was somebody who was a keen hiker or a climber um, or had some sort of reason for being there. Some people, like, like Dave here, I found him at Kiev Eichbothy up at Cape Ruth and he was completely on his own and he'd walked across Cape Ruth to be there purely and simply just to have some peace and quiet. Didn't really go too much into his reasons why but he kept himself to himself and then we announced that we had a bottle of whiskey with us and then lo he appeared in our room. Um, and we had a really great evening just drinking whiskey um, and the next morning he was having his morning coffee and I set up with a 210 lens outside and just and made that portrait of him and then asked his permission afterwards and he was totally fine with it. And for those who don't know, Kierweg, that is Kierweg. John. So I met John at Strabeg Bothy, which is a fairly easy walk in. Um, beautiful, beautiful Bothy. I don't think it gets that busy. Um, it's famous because it has a f a, a, an actual bathroom in it, but it doesn't work, so please, please don't use it. Um, but I walked in, and he was sat on his own in front of the fire, and he looked over his shoulder, and I was just stood there, and it was kind of an awkward moment, I'm like, what's happening? And he pulled a chair over and told me to sit down. So I sat down, and he opened his bag up, which you see on his back there, and presented this, the biggest lump of cheese I've ever seen someone carry in a backpack plonked it down on the table. He opened up a tray of dried meat and two bottles of Evian, which were filled with Bell's whiskey. I was like, I can't possibly have this by myself. I was like, well, no, I'm surprised that you thought you could. Um, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we spent the whole evening taking it in terms of saw up firewood um, and sharing all this food and all this whiskey. And he had some amazing stories to tell. Um, and in the morning, just before he left, he was just sat down doing his crossword. and. Um, a nice bit of window light coming in was what I needed to make to make that portrait. For those that don't know, um, that is Strabeg Bothy. That was just after he left. I thought I'd include a Welsh Bothy, just so I don't get any um, angry Welsh people come up to me afterwards. Don't worry, you're being represented. Um, this is Doolin, um, actually one of the favourite ones I ever stayed at. Um, just for the, the, the mammoth landscape behind it, you feel so small when you're in that bothy, um, especially when there's a winter storm coming in behind there. Um, it's really quite an intimidating place and it's this big, long building with two big rooms and it's completely empty and you just sleep on the floorboards, um, listening to the doors rattle on their hinges and it was a um, really, really impressive night. This was walked on the, um, taken on the walk in. Um, I'd set up. And there were these waves of like snow coming in and I thought, well, I'll wait until it's just masking off that, that um, rock face at the back. And it did. And then a mountain rescue helicopter started hovering directly in my shot. So I waited for that. And then luckily another wave came back and um, took that image. And that's me where, waiting for it. For those that care, it, that was on the, the 300 lens. How are we for time, Tim? Where is Tim? I know I asked you for no prompts, but I've forgotten to hit the timer, so... I'd oh, great. So, this image of Rye Vowen, this was the last image I shot for the project. Um, I'd already figured out that I'd shot it before, when in spring, um, and I'd kind of figured out that it would look better in winter because of these little trees in the foreground here. Um, and also, if you got the timing right, the last bit of light will just be hitting the side of the bothy. 
And so it's quite an easy walk in from Glenmore, and I got to the Bothy in plenty of time. I was like, right, I'm going to set myself up on that hill, I'm just going to wait. And a man comes out and makes conversation with me. And I love conversation, but I was watching this sun just drop. And he was talking, and he was talking, and then I said, look, I'm really sorry, mate, I've, I've, I've got to go. I've got to go and get this, this photo. And I ran up the side of this hill, and I think I unpacked the 5-4 setup and shot that in, I think, about three minutes. Um, I took two sheets of film. Uh, the first one has that light on it, and the second one is completely dark. So literally seconds to spare. Um, and that was the last trip. Um, obviously, the, the project, there's about 35 images in the project, so I've shown you a selection here. Um, and that was uh, one of the last dark slides um, for three years of, of work. And then I had this really, um, I want to keep that up there for a while, because it's quite terrifying, isn't it? Um, I had this weird experience where I shot these last images, and I'd just spent three years doing this work um, just because it was, I wanted to. That was kind of the reason. Um, and I walked back to the car from Rive Owen, and then I had an 11-hour drive back. Um, and I was like, well, what am I going to do with this work? Where's it going to go? So I made the decision on that drive home um, to quit my job. Um, so the whole time I was working as a studio photographer, as I said, and I was like, I don't want all this to sit on a hard drive. And that's it. So I quit my job and took that leap of faith. Um, my brother's a, a freelance musician and he took this leap of faith and he told me, you've got to take it. So I did, so it's his fault. Um, I have no money. Um, but I took that leap of faith and realized that I'm just gonna have to market this work. And I knew that I had to get some attention for it and I wanted people to publish it and I wanted people to see it. Um, so the behind the scenes images were for that reason. So wh I was, when I was in the Bothies, I was writing a diary because there's like bugger all else to do really. So I wrote and Andy made these behind the scenes images. So I had the final project and I had all this marketing stuff. Um, thankfully, Rab, the clothing company, uh, had picked up that I was doing this project and they were posting drip feeding content out onto their social media feeds um, and also giving me loads of free coats, which is really nice. Um, which I couldn't have afforded to do. <laughs> so I was already kind of slowly building an audience up for the work whilst I was making it. And so when I finished it and kind of announced it online, I didn't have to do a lot of work until it started getting picked up. So this is a handful of the magazines that it, it went into pretty quickly. So the top there is the Royal Photographic Society Journal. Um, the bottom left is the BJP. Um, and the right one here, that's... Um, that went in the British Airways magazine, so it went in the back of every British Airways flight in the world for 30 days. Um, and just to emphasise the power of social media, that happened through Twitter. Uh, he just messaged me and I sent him the photos and then it went out with British Airways. And ultimately, um, that led to the publication of Black Dot's book, which came out at the beginning of this year. Um, it sold out, so unfortunately there aren't any copies up there. However, the publisher, Another Place Press, um, do have some books up there. Um, I urge you to go check them out. He's this incredible guy who works out of his house up in the Highlands and is able to make contemporary landscape photography accessible. So I think the book retailed at like 16 quid. We did an edition of 400. I think it sold out in, in three weeks, maybe four weeks, something like that. Um, so to complete the package, um, I had all this material and I wanted to make a short film. And so I teamed up with a filmmaker called Ryan Goff, who works out of the Peak District and we decided to go back to the first Bothy that I'd ever been to um, and make a short film to promote the project and promote my photography so it could sit at this lovely little media pack to send off to people. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to show you um, that film now. I like to photograph kind of untold stories, really, about the British landscape.
and I think you know, more recently um, that story has been Boffy Culture. Black Dots is a project exploring Bothies uh, across the whole of the United Kingdom. The project sort of came out of nowhere and, and grew out of a sort of fascination and intrigue really. And I think the best projects, that's where they come from. The interesting thing about Bothies and, and the culture that surrounds them is that it's a story that's constantly changing and it's constantly evolving. With every time someone new enters a Bothy, the story gets a little bit bigger. And this, the same Bothy can change depending on the weather and depending on the people that are there. So there, there's so many ways in which the, the, the Bothy story can, can evolve and can change over time. When you, you sort of walk into a Bothy, especially if you're the first one there or the only one there, uh, it, it can sometimes seem like quite an intimidating experience. You walk into this cold, dark space um, that is incredibly primitive and very bare bones. Um, but it's, it's surprising how quickly these kind of little shelters can come alive and be converted into this really kind of homely, cosy atmosphere uh, when, a, when the fire's raging and you've got the candles on. And, sipping into a whiskey and things like that. My name is Nicholas White and I am a photographer. Warn Scale is what I believe to be an old mining structure. Inside it's got this amazing window that just overlooks, like directly over Buttermere, uh, and it's just the most idyllic location and such a beautiful view for what is essentially a very rugged and, and sort of industrial landscape. I use the large format camera to shoot most, if not all, of my personal work. Um, I think, you know, maybe, maybe part of it is perhaps a break away from the fact that I shoot an entirely digital workflow when I'm not doing personal work. So it's quite nice to be able to come out somewhere like this, slow it right down and make me think about my photography but also give the landscape the time that it deserves. And when you're out in the mountains and you're using an old manual camera like that and you're just so focused on operating all these little sort of knobs and kind of dials, it just becomes just part of that experience for me of being out in the mountains. So, <clears throat> moving on um, to some new work, which I actually I've never, never ever shown before um, because it's not finished yet. I like to say that I work on long projects that span many years, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've only done one because I'm 29. But that's the plan, I'm going to do that. Um, so I entered Black Dots into um, a number of awards and competitions and more often than not got that response of, you know, we're overwhelmed with the entries this year. And Unfortunately, you've not been successful. But I, you know, what I grew to realise is that doesn't actually matter because it doesn't mean that your work is bad. It doesn't. It's not a reflection on on the hours of work you've put in. It's it's merely just the opinion of a handful of people on that particular day. That they were looking for something different. Um, but I persevered and I, I discovered this bursary um, with the Royal Photographic Society called the Environmental Bursary. And there's an under 30s and an over 30s and it's about I think about 3,000 pounds to to start a new project that has a kind of an environmental side to it and for a while I'd been aware of this term rewilding that had been kind of bouncing around um, which is essentially about restoring natural processes and you know nature allowing nature to decide its own course but a lot of the time the conversation about rewilding gets diverted towards the reintroduction of bears and wolves and that kind of distracts the, the rest of the story and that conversation about what rewilding means um, and the various initiatives that are happening around the world with it. 
Um, so I started reading up about rewilding and thinking, well, maybe I could make an interesting story about that, but I just had to find the right story. Uh, and I found it um, in Romania. Um, there's, there's a few uh, initiatives happening in Romania currently. Uh, I think WWF have got some stuff going on, and there's a, there's a load of smaller organisations and NGOs doing their bit. Um, but Romania is a fascinating country in that it's one of Europe's last remaining true wilderness areas. It's got some of the largest unfragmented forests in the continent, home to the majority of you know, predators. They've got bears, wolves, lynx, chamois. Um, it's, it's just a stunning, stunning place. But after the fall of communism, where previously kind of state-owned forests were handed back, um, they were fell into the hands of private people, and then you had this huge period where the forest was being illegally logged, and there was a lot of illegal hunting going on. Um, so to stop that, there's an organisation called Foundation Conservation Carpathia, uh, or Carpathia for short, um, who are buying up areas, huge areas of forest, and ultimately they're going to connect these land holdings and then release them to the public in the form of a new national park or a European wilderness reserve. Um, they want it to be Europe's answer to Yellowstone and to persuade the local people that they can get money through ecotourism as opposed to just destroying everything. Um, and for me that was a really interesting story and I was reading about it and I was thinking, in my experience, national parks either exist or they don't. Um, there's never that kind of limbo between. So I flew out and went out with the rangers, here's two of them here, this is the behind the scenes shot I took, to try and understand first and foremost before taking photographs, before going out with the 5-4 and you know stampeding around Romania taking landscapes, trying to understand firstly how do you do that? How do you build an, a national park? Um, you know that there are no five simple steps to creating your national park, you know it's, it's a really abstract and obscure thing and it takes a long long time um, and so I, I, I embedded myself with the wildlife ranger team, um, or the guardians of the forest as they're called, which is just the most incredible job title. Um, and the camera was in the boot, but mostly just kind of getting to know the people. Because the NGO, they have a lot of people coming out, media teams, local news, whatever, and they go in for two days, they disrupt their work, and they get what they need to get, and then they leave. And I knew that in order to tell this story, I needed to embed myself for a few years. And so a huge part of that really is making the guys realise that I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. Um, I'm there to help as well. And so a lot of the time, these guys are teaching me how to track wolves. They're teaching me how to identify wolf hair, bear hair, all this kind of stuff. Um, we've got ourselves into some really interesting situations doing that. But it's through that understanding and through that kind of social aspect of things that you get yourself into unique positions. Um, which I found myself in. Um, so a lot of the time I'm, I'm kind of travelling around with the rangers. I've given myself very, very strict boundaries, so I only make work within designated project areas, um, which sometimes is killer because you can be standing somewhere and the most amazing landscape is on that side of the road and the light's perfect, but the project area starts here and it goes this way. And so then I'm, I'm having to find stuff. So it, it's a bit difficult, but those boundaries are very helpful in controlling the work, because otherwise you end up just photographing all over the country and it becomes this kind of broken project of photos of Romania that don't really talk about the thing I want to talk about. Uh, this is in Chalcanu, um, in the Dambovich Wada hunting area. The charity have bought two to three of the hunting areas, so in those areas no hunting takes place uh, and no logging takes place. They have a relationship with the surrounding hunting areas whereby they can go in and take samples. Um, so scat, bear scat, they measure footprints, they take the hair off trees. Um, and all of these samples and all of this data is taken back to a lab and logged into an app, which you can look at online. And it will tell you where each sample was, what animal it was, what direction it was moving, etc., etc. And so it's through that process that they can monitor the wildlife, um, as opposed to chipping or anything that kind of intervenes with the wildlife at all. Uh, I feel like I'm moving into that area of like that guy that takes small buildings in big landscapes, but it, it's, a relevant, it's a relevant shot, so I, I included it. 
Uh, another huge part really is giving a face to those who are kind of really at the coal face of European conservation uh, in Romania. Um, so talking about rewilding, not through photographing bears, not through photographing wolves, because there are some really, really great photographers who can do that a lot better than me. Um, and so my angle is really doing it through the eyes of the rangers. Um, so the kind of the human element of rewilding. So this is a living you uh, on patrol in the Rukar hunting area. And, uh, and Razvan, who uh, likes to think of himself as a bit of an Indiana Jones type, I think. Um, so I, I was making these images, and a lot of it, I think it's, it's very painful because I don't have much choice over the light I'm working in. I don't have much choice over the conditions or what I'm going to photograph that day, because I'm photographing the rangers, and they don't work when there's lovely golden light. <laughs> they work in the middle of the day. Um, so um, it, it's quite restrictive, but I'm enjoying that process of kind of just having to make something out of any given situation. Um, but also I, I got back from a few of these trips and I had the landscapes and I had the portraits and I felt like I was falling into that black dots template of landscape portrait, landscape portrait, which is a kind of tried and tested formula. And I was like, well, how can I talk about the process of creating this national park? And as I said before, there is no five steps. There is no like clear cut way of doing it. And through being with the rangers, I figured out that actually what it's about is little people doing little things in big places over a very, very, very long period of time. And so I found myself stepping further and further and further back with the camera, setting up the five four and just waiting for these scenes to present themselves. Um, so here you've got um, Razvan and Livinu, or Livyu, sorry. Um, analysing a bare footprint in a muddy puddle. You can't see that in the photograph. You just look at two blokes doing something somewhere. But it's an attempt to play into that abstract nature of the project that they're working on. You don't entirely know what's going on. Each individual job goes completely unnoticed, but after a decade, it eventually will create a national park. Um, so I did a lot of these images where I, I, I stepped back and so you've got um, the rangers there in their trusty Dacia Duster, which apparently is the best car in the world, not because it's Romanian. No, apparently it's genuinely the best car in the world. Um, and <laughs> so the, this is just like, they were driving down and I said, guys, can you, can you just drop me off here? And I just wait and they get out and they stop and they start looking. I knew they were gonna look down this bank because um, there's been a bear in this area um, attacking villages and, or villages and pigs. Um, and so they're trying to find evidence of that bear to try and figure out where it's moving to and from. The problem is, <coughs> the bears are dangerous and my poor mother um, gets very concerned when I, I announce I'm going to Romania again. Um, and because I'm photographing the rangers far away, it means I'm on my own. The problem isn't the bears. The problem is the shepherds got annoyed with the bears attacking their livestock. So they thought the solution, in their infinite wisdom, was to buy really aggressive dogs and they just let them loose. So that'll deal with the bear problem. Unfortunately, they also attack humans. So in avoiding the bear attacks, you actually put yourself at a higher risk because there are more injuries and deaths through dog attack than there are through bears. So you're constantly, your head's constantly on a swivel and obviously I'm using this stupid camera with a bloody blanket over my head. <laughs> so it's, it's not the best situation to be in, but the rangers assure me that I'll be fine. So I don't know what that means. Uh, this is in the bush, a hunting area. Um, I say wilderness, this looks like it's just a really remote place, and it is. There's like these tiny little house right behind me, though, and as I was shooting this, this family come out, and they learn that I'm, I'm English, and they don't speak um, English, and I don't speak much Romanian. Um, and they're like, okay, okay, so I'm taking a picture, okay. And they go away, and I hear them coming back, so I take the dark cloth off, and they come back with this tray of sausages. It's like, perfect. That's never happened to me, like, <laughs> apart from the cheese incident. So I seem to have lucked out, really, with my landscape photography. There's a temptation to photograph cliches in Romania. Um, those hay bales, for example, um, very, very Romanian, very distinctive. So I spend a lot of time in Romania so I can kind of absorb those cliches, get used to them so they become the norm, and then you start ignoring them. And then you can find the hidden gems and stuff. But for this image, it just, it just worked, so I, it'd be rude not to. Uh, in the background there, that's um, 
Piazza de Claire National Park, which is this impressive limestone ridge. It takes three days to walk across it. Um, and it, it kind of it translates as the King's Rock, and that's a national park. Um, and so the new national park will be a border with that national park, which will create this huge um, place where the bears can migrate um, in, in, you know, without being shot, essentially. Uh, this is one of the many checkpoints in the Dambavichwara hunting area. The area is made up of um, huge, really deep limestone gorges, um, which you have to pay 20p to enter. Um, but additionally, they're there to just make sure that the people that go in are coming back out again. The weather's interesting over there. Winter, it gets to about minus 20. Um, and the summers are blisteringly hot. This is another huge part, aside from the wildlife ranges, um, another big part is replanting the forests that were illegally felled. Um, and so they, they pay local villages and local people um, to, to come out with the replanting team um, into these huge areas and replant hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spruce. Um, so this was taken, I went out for a day replanting forests, um, planted a few myself, and then these guys are having their coffee break, um, which seems to happen a lot. Um, but they're having their coffee break and made this portrait on the back of an Addo, which is a classic Romanian truck, which was the second best car in the world. This one here, this is taken uh, from the back of a snowmobile um, on a 300mm lens on the 5.4, looking down onto a frozen lake. Um, and a wolf, not a wolf, a fox, I think this is a fox, had crossed the lake that morning um, and it just made this really interesting shot. Um, they told me I shouldn't shoot Petronagu Lake because it's a reservoir, so it's not man-made, but the ice that covered it is natural, so. Cheers, mate. This one here, um, this was taken earlier this month. This is one of the new, the new photos. Um, I put... I, was, I, I do a lot of Instagramming and faffing about on my phone when I should be, you know, actually enjoying life in real life. But I was doing stories about this, and <coughs> that's a bear trap you can see at the bottom. And a lot of people got quite angry with me when I put that. So, oh, we're moving a bear trap today. Oh, what do you mean trapping bears? Yeah. A huge part of the work of this organisation is managing that coexistence because this is a, a working landscape. Um, and obviously thousands of years ago, you wouldn't have a problem. So to the idea of rewilding it back to a state it was in thousands of years ago is, you know, ridiculous because people live there now and it doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> so managing that um, coexistence with the landscape is a crucial role and winning hearts and minds of the local people as well who are trying to explain to them that you shouldn't cut down that tree and make some quick money. You should wait 10 years because someone might come and stay at your guest house. It's, 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 it's a difficult process, but... As I mentioned earlier, there was a pig, um, a, a bear that was attacking pigs, and we were in a neighbouring valley and we got where the trap was originally, and we got a call in the radio saying that this farmer had found their pig had been attacked in this valley. Could we come and help? And so we loaded that bear trap onto the trailer, drove to the next, um, next valley, and got into his farm. And unfortunately for the pig, the bear hadn't quite finished the job which is quite a difficult situation to be in because you're like, this is pretty gory. Um, so do I photograph it? Do I not? Don't worry, it's not up there. I didn't photograph the pig because the important thing about what was happening wasn't so much a pig had been attacked. It was more with how these people are going to deal with that situation and how the rangers operate, you know. And so I, I offered some help and they told me I wasn't strong enough. So I was like, I'll just go take some photos or something. So I, I, I sat on this hill and I just waited for this scene to unfold. Um, so the rangers arrive, there's about eight people there. And when you see it printed big, there's like a, there's a little kid just watching over from the play park, watching what's going on. Um, and they move this, this bear trap outside um, the farmhouse. They then have to place the pig into the cage as live bait in the hope that the bear will come back get trapped in the cage, and when I say trapped, it's just, it triggers a little trip wire and the door closes, so there's, you know, it's no, no snares or anything like that. Um, the bear then gets tranquilized and then taken in a trailer to that distant mountain, Papusha, in the background, where it will arrive back in about a week. But 
it's that process of managing. We don't want to shoot the bear, but these people have to survive as well. And so they just, this constant game of trying to find the bear, catching it, moving it, it comes back again, it attacks something else, and it just repeats. Um, this is actually the final slide. Um, I'm going to end on this portrait uh, of Mushu um, on his land. He's one of the, the older wildlife rangers um, for Carpathia. His family have farmed this area um, for about 150 years. And I asked him through a fixer, a translator, I asked him, why are you a ranger? Why have you done this? Because he got his, you know, his work cut out with trying to farm on a near vertical field. Um, and he said that over his life, he's watched his landscape disappear from his window. And he looks out over what, one of the hunting areas and he said that he felt like by becoming a ranger, he could have some sort of input in controlling his view. Um, which is important, you know, but ultimately, you know, it, this national park where the trees are being planted, you know, he's not going to live to see the results of all this effort. Um, but like I said earlier, it's, it's these tiny little jobs done by individuals over a long period of time, born out of a love of the place that they live, um, that will ultimately create this, this new national park. Um, and then just to end with some shameless self-promotion, but thank you very much for listening.